It is my privilege to have a conversation with Dr. Elias Willemse. He is a co-founder of Waste Labs, a company whose mission it is to modernize waste collection planning and accelerate the transition to circular materials and sustainable products. Background in data-driven optimization, and they are bringing waste logistics on par with the advances that we see in modern forward logistics. Elias is a former student of mine and turned friend, turned colleague, uh, and we've been in touch over the years as his journey um, took him across the world and currently based in London in the United Kingdom. Right, good afternoon, Elias. It's really nice to, um, to have this interview with you. I think it's one of the interviews that I've really looked forward to for, for a number of years. Um, but I think as an introduction, um, maybe from your side, a quick overview in terms of your journey. You went from a non-academic research environment um, at the, the Council for uh, Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR. You went into consulting, decided that's not for you, or maybe it is for you, and, but then you came back to academic research and happy to have called you my, my colleague for a number of years. Um, you then did a postdoc, a tech startup right now, and now you're based in London. So if you can, from your perspective, I mean, it's one thing to kind of look at your profile and, and see what's going on and where you're traveling, but it's how did this pan out for you specifically in in the, let's call it the, um, the waste collection, um, yeah. from that perspective. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> it's an interesting journey if you lay it out like that, especially, um, I guess like some people might ask what I'm doing with my life and what my long term term um, plan or goal is, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's been a, it's, it's been a colorful journey. And, um, I think what started it off was, um, probably operations research. Uh, which um, which you taught me back in what was it 2006? Around about yeah 2006 yeah so almost uh, almost 20 years ago now, um, and um, I just like this concept of um, of using of using models and mathematical models to make better business decisions. So it's it's it was from early on it was a concept that kind of resonated with me. Um, you know, this whole process of taking a business problem, converted it into a model, and then the solution to your model gives you a good answer to your business problem. Um, so that that kind of got me going on this path. And then um, I wanted a way to kind of master it because I realized it's quite a complex field. Um, so after my studies, I had a choice. I can either go into um, industry, um, and I thought I might have limited opportunities to to master um, this tool or, or these concepts, or I can go into research. Um, and that's what kind of got me into research, non-academic research. Um, I just felt there was a good environment to, to kind of play around with these um, concepts, master them, and still get some exposure and, and decent money on the side. So that, 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 well, decent, relatively speaking, decent compared to a student salary. But uh, so then, yeah, I worked at the CSR for a while and, and did a few of these kind of modeling projects um, and then also started to work on waste collection. Um, and how do you how do you model waste collection and solve waste collection problems? Um, so, I mean, it was interesting at academia um, or non-research. Um, I think I was a bit frustrated by the lack of impact um, at the research institution. It, it's still research. So then I thought, well, let's go into consulting. Uh, went into consulting, and I think the impact of consulting is even less than the impact of um, research sometimes. Should, should, should I edit this part out or not? <laughs> 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 um, so, um, yeah, I went into consulting, um, you know, consulted a lot, um, probably didn't deliver that much, but um, and then decided a change was in order. This is not what I want. Um, so then I went back into academia to finish my PhD. Uh, to continue working on um, kind of trying to solve waste collection problems. Um, and then at some stage, I realized like, well, it would probably go, be a good experience to also change countries and see how, you know, how does research work and how does um, academia work and how, how do projects work in different countries? 
Um, so through some channels, I got into Singapore, uh, got a postdoc slash sabbatical in Singapore for a year. Um, and while in Singapore, I was still doing research. And then I decided, you know what, um, I think there is actually good applied modeling work that you can do in industry. Uh, so I wanted to give it another shot. Um, and then I got pulled into the startup scene. So there was just an organization in Singapore that said, hey, if, if, you're, an, if you're a good academic and you've got good research um, credentials, why don't you try and start a company? Why don't you commercialize the research and start a company? Um, and that, that kind of forced me into, into the newest um, chapter, which is now founded a, a company that's, that's building software, trying to build software that um, that helps with waste and recycling planning. So yeah, the, the constant thread of all in this, as you were correct, was more waste logistics or reverse logistics and recycling logistics. And it, it came through from, you know, kind of playing with it as a research project to more serious research into a PhD, and now finally trying to uh, productize it and commercialize it and kind of get get people to pay money to solve their problems using using the the research. I mean, it's, it's, it's still a fascinating field because I think most people stop thinking about their garbage when they actually put the bag or the trolley bin outside and it gets picked up um, and kind of forget that every city in the world probably needs to provide the service. And as cities grow, this becomes a more and more a, a challenge because we want livable cities and with higher density of people it, it the the density of waste becomes higher the density of consumption becomes higher and and you need trucks for that uh. yeah it, it is and what's interesting is i think um that statement was very true maybe um up to three years ago four years ago but around 2020 when we started you can see the uh, the kind of mind shift changes. People are becoming a lot more sustainability focused, uh, a lot more aware. And initially, even ven venture capital firms were really interested in what we were doing because they kind of saw this as a new frontier. Like, oh, people are becoming more aware of what's going on. What are you doing in the space to to make it better? So it, I must say it has changed quite a lot the last two years. Um, Unfortunately, it's almost too mainstream for a startup now. Like if we speak to a venture capital firm, they're like, yeah, okay, another. Everybody recycles, everybody is environmentally conscious. And <laughs> it's like, oh, there's tons of companies that's now trying to solve this problem. You know, you're not that special anymore. So it, it, it's, it's, it's changed since I started in 2006 up to, up to now. Okay. Well, at least you can, you've been part of that wave. Uh, yeah, yeah. But you also don't want to be that old grumpy person that's angry that the wave passed you by and you, you didn't get credit, you know, like I've been working on this since 2006. You know? um, so you always have to kind of earn your seat at the table, irrespective of where you started. So, um, yeah, it's always important to continue as to, you know, how do you add value using this? You can't, you can't just expect you, you have a, a right to add value because you've been doing it for a long time. Um, it doesn't work like that. Uh. Right. So if we look at the business side of things um, in supply chains, in terms of forward logistics, we very often talk about strategic decisions, kind of your long term facility location problems, your tactical planning type of problems, medium term fleet sizing and operational day to day uh, type of, of decisions. And we'll will follow up in terms of, of the conversation because the, the purpose of this interview is to kind of challenge some of these traditional ways of sequential decision making. But typically, what do these traditional decisions look like specifically in the field of waste collection? Uh, what are some of the interesting nuances that of these of the waste collection problem variants that you've actually seen all over the world over the past couple of years? Yeah, so um, no, that, that's a good question. Um, maybe to start with the re the reverse of it is to start with the operations of it, just the day to day operations. Um, I think the first nuance is just the, and you touched upon this, is just the sheer scale of it. Um, so for for any waste collector anywhere in the world, it's typical to have to have to service like ten thousand collection points on a daily basis. Um, 
And I think that would put it on par with like your biggest um, third party or last mile delivery company. Sure. Um, so the, the scale of it is is, is, is crazy. And so there's many really profits. Been... I mean, it's very often cities that have to, it, it's just a sink. There's, there's, yeah. there's very little money to be made. So it's, it's, it's really a, a cost center. It's not, it's not a profit center. Yeah, correct, correct. So it's, it's um, and it's, you have to do it, it's the essential service, there's not a lot of money in it. So it's always that conflict of um, how much to invest in this to make it better. Um, and then it's, 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 the scale of it is, is like very complex uh, to do it as well. So um, I think that's the biggest, um, one of the biggest unique points of, of, of recycling and waste collection is the sheer scale of it. Um, and then the second unique point, but I mean, this, this becomes very tech, um, um, technical, is in waste and recycling, you have the ability to offload um, or replenish at a bunch of facilities. So um, with normal logistics, um, you, you have warehouses, but you have a fixed number of warehouses. And the warehouses are usually quite picky in terms of you can't just go to any warehouse and pick up stock. Because you know it becomes a bit difficult if, if you've got a bunch of trucks running everywhere. Um, whereas in ways this is not the case. If, if you have if you have landfill sites, you can go to any landfill site. If you have incineration plants, you can go to any incineration plant. So to bring that into your planning, like what what is the best route, what is the best sequence, given that you can pretty much offload anyway, um, that also adds adds a layer of complexity that's that's not that present in other. Um, at least logistics uh, or delivery type of problems um, that we've seen. So, so that's on the operational level. I'll just say that's the two main things um, that is um, that is quite different. Um, maybe a third one that I have to mention is even though it's it's very dense, you you get like massive trucks that do this. So you end up with a 24 ton truck doing like almost door to door collections. Oh. So. It, Imagine, imagine DHL will never drive around with a 24-ton truck to do deliveries. <laughs> like it doesn't work. It's challenging. But this is what waste collection companies do: is uh, they just drive around with these massive trucks, um, like almost doing last-mile delivery, very slowly. So, um, and that is challenges. So that means when you do this planning, you have to be very accurate. Um, you know, it's. A van is a bit more forgiving. Like if you mess up a bit, a van can make a U-turn, not a problem. Um, <laughs> with a truck, um, yeah, they they might they might cause a few accidents if um, they messed up their route planning and they now have to make a U-turn in the middle of a busy intersection. So, um, so operationally, that is, um, I think that's the some of the nuances uh, that we deal with. Uh, I, th I think the. Yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, the, the, the idea of, of fleet sizing, th these are pretty expensive vehicles. Yeah, it is. Um, th that then goes more towards the tactical decision making is, yeah, what, what kind of resources do we need? Do we insource? Do we outsource? Um, you know, can we use another service provider? Um, so then that comes into play. And often this is pretty standard. So here yeah, the industry is not that innovative. They're like, yeah, we, we will use a 24-ton truck um, rear end loader to collect the waste because that's what we started using 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> so where, where it does become tricky is like how many of these do you need for a new area? Um, and, um, and then other things that's now coming into play is pressure to move over to electrical vehicles. So even waste companies is facing that. So then that then becomes the more tactical problems that they are faced with. It's just what resources do we need? What technology do we use? Um, that and, and usually this technology lasts them about five or seven years and then um, it gets replaced. Okay. okay. I, I recently kind of heard, and I mean, if you think about it, it's fairly kind of, it kind of is, is somewhat common sense, but that um, a huge difference between the electric vehicles and and more traditional fossil fuel vehicles is the fact that um, if you have start stop um, situations, which is very common in waste collection, the electric vehicle actually becomes better uh, because it replenishes mm. and 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 captures some, or or converts some of that braking energy uh, back into into yeah. electricity. Whereas that is a that's a killer for a fossil fuel uh, truck. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. They they perform better in uh, slower driving. Um, the only problem is in waste, you also need compaction. Uh, so your compact, it takes electricity. And then the big one is your batteries are quite heavy. So you lose capacity on the vehicle because you have to carry big uh, batteries. Is, in, in, in terms of waste, is it is it mainly a volume problem or is it very often a, 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 a weight problem? In, in pure waste collection, it's it's a weight problem because of the compactors. Uh, when it comes to recycling, it becomes a volume problem uh, because they can't always compact um, the material. I mean, you refer to to landfills. So if you think about long term location type of problems, you don't just open a new landfill. On the contrary, you, you try to to avoid them completely. So what type of interesting strategic decisions on problems have, have you encountered? Yeah, the strategic problems, um, usually one that's that's sort of between uh, medium term and strategic is just where do you put the vehicle depot? Uh, and how many vehicle depots do you do you want? And where do you place them? Um, so that's, uh, I think that's a little bit in between tactical and strategical because you can change depot. That's not the, um, that's not that bad. And then your really strategic problems is one, like you said, um, where do you place your treatment infrastructure? So landfills are probably the most difficult one to place uh, because of the nuance, but um, more perhaps more appropriate would be recycling centers or material recovery centers. So they um, they can also be placed, but this is this is a long term commitment. Like you, you're going to be stuck with that location for 20 years. Um, and then another strategic location, um, which is interesting and, and which we've dealt with a lot is for private waste collection companies is if they want to enter new markets. So, for example, you have Veolia or Suez, uh, big waste collection companies, and they want to know, should they try and set up operations or a new business in a new country like Singapore or Hong Kong or Thailand? And those are also more strategic decisions. Um, that that you need to make, and and then then it becomes an interesting exercise. Like, is it worth? Can you get profit there? Is it worth to try and set up operations there? How much will it cost? Um, do you build facilities in those locations? So then it becomes very strategic. Um, and then another one, sorry, last one is um, especially under the private waste collection companies is they tend to buy each other a lot. So there's a lot of mergers and acquisitions. Uh, which is again a strategic decision. Like, is it do, do I do I buy my competitor? Can I get extra efficiencies in my operations by consolidating consolidating my operations with my competitors' operations, or just limit so my competition in the process? Yeah, 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 usually usually when you buy a competitor in a situation like this, is you 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 pay a fair market value because you think you can um, you can improve your efficiencies by combining the operations. So um, then the combined cost of the two um, the two setups is um, is less than um, the individual cost. So the, those are like very strategic decisions um, related to supply chain. Previously, we discussed the interaction between these different levels of strategic, tactical, and operational decision making. And I'm particularly interested um, that you expand a bit on your experience in terms of how um, sometimes you can try to optimize at the operational level, but you kind of run into problems because there are upstream tactical and strategic decisions that are now locking you in that, that does not allow you to optimize any further. What's your experience there? Because yeah. I, I think, unfortunately, we see these very often in supply chain as uh, you do the one, then you do the next, and it's kind of this linear decision making. But it's it's the kind of feedback and re-evaluation that I guess is is equally important. Yeah, ab absolutely. So, um, yeah, we see this a lot because especially at the startup is we, um, we, we our value is that we can save our clients money. So we often go to a waste company and then we start with operations and then we say, oh, by how much can we improve your collection operations? And then often the answer is like two or three percent. That's it. No ball. Like the system is running at a quite efficient level already and there's not much improvement you can you can make on the system. So um, uh, perhaps this would be a good good um, switching point to just kind of um, show what I mean with this. Um, so if this is visible, uh, let me just jump to the end. 
So this is what we will typically do. We will take an area and then we will say, okay, this, this is, is the Singapore, area. All right. Yeah, this is Singapore. Yeah, the okay. contents. Um, and this area, as small as it looks, probably has around 20 or 30,000 collection points already, um, even though it's so small. Um, so what we will do is we will say, okay, how many resources do you need? So then we would do route planning. Uh, when we say, okay, let's say the vehicle starts from a depot there and the incineration plant is there. So it will collect waste, collect, 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 collect. And as the vehicles are full, they go to the incineration plant. And then they will go back, collect, 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 go back to incineration plant, and then go back to the depot at the end. Um, so this is what we will calculate. And then what we want to know is through our algorithms, um, how much better um, is the route from our algorithm compared to how they're currently doing it? And often, oftentimes the um, difference is very low. It's like we can do it maybe two or three percent better. Okay. Um, so, the so they've built up quite a lot of, it's called tacit knowledge and experience over time in terms of yeah. trial and error. Yes, um, that as well. And the other factor is, I don't know if this table is visible. Um, if you look at if you look at what the vehicles are actually doing, um, you'll see the time that they spend traveling is about two hours. The time that they spend collecting is seven hours. When we build these routes, what we're trying, the only thing we can really improve is how much they travel. So in this sense, we already limited to um, if a vehicle spends nine hours of its day doing stuff, um, we can only improve on three hours of that. Yeah. So even a 20% improvement, which would sound amazing, is only 20% of 20%, which is, I think that's 4% actually, if I'm not mistaken. So um, that, that already shows you that um, it doesn't matter how good the algorithms are, um, the impact that we have is very limited. Okay. Um, Operationally. But, operationally, yes. But for but what the what the um, client can do is perhaps they can use different vehicles and that allows them to collect quicker. So if they use different vehicles, smaller vehicles, uh, then maybe they can push down their collecting uh, collection time. Which and means then is the technical fleet sizing. Technical. Exactly, exactly. But you also need the routes then. So you need to do both then to actually figure out is it worth doing. Um, and then another one is, um, even at this one, is they spend a lot of time driving to and from the incineration plant. So um, that is probably where most of their driving time is actually, is going to and from the incineration plant. Um, and you can't change that plant. So even that savings is not possible um, to do. And that then goes to the strategic decision. Um, like, um, you know, it, and uh, they actually shut down this incineration plant. And now you can only use these three. In well, Singapore, which is completely the other side of the island. Correct. And that means any savings that you get by optimizing the routes percentage wise is now even smaller because they're just spending all their time driving to and from um, the island. And so these are strategic decisions that are influencing um, the efficiency of the overall system. Um, and I mean, often choice, the decision to put it here, um, I don't think it had much to do with how far these vehicles are going to drive. It's just, this is the industrial area. Uh, it's close to the port. So uh, we want to shift um, our operations there. So it, 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 it's challenging in that sense to, um, to only look at one thing in isolation. And you very quickly find out that, um, you know, by just doing day-to-day -day operational planning, um, the, the improvement that you can get is, is limited just by, just by the way that the overall system is set up. Um, and it might be too late. You, you can't change the overall system uh, because that decision was was made a while ago already. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm glad that you kind of bring this up because it also um, captures something that I've been thinking about a lot recently is that, I mean, I love my optimization models. Um, but very often they, they can be very, very fragile um, in terms of the life of the solution is sometimes smaller than the time that it took you to develop the algorithms and actually solve the problem. Um, yeah. And Nassim Taleb in his, in his books 
uh, or specifically in the book Anti-Fragile, talks about fragile models and that we have to guard that we don't just find robust solutions, but that we really look for anti-fragile solutions. Um, and these are solutions that benefit from uncertainty. And I, I guess if you aggregate waste collection, it's very the aggregated values are fairly certain. So there's there's some uncertainty, but as soon as you aggregate, it becomes a fairly predictable type of, of situation. But there are other things in terms of trucks that break down or crews that don't necessarily show up or something. So what are interesting anti-fragile solutions or, that you can kind of think about in, in the supply chain setting? How can we come up very often not with mathematical solutions, but just kind of common sense type of heuristics yeah. that are that are an, an, uh, anti-fragile. And at least in logistics, I found ideas of theories, uh, uh, theory of constraints fairly um, anti-fragile by definition. Yeah, um, it's a good point. It, it might be worth to maybe distinguish between um, you know, uh, variability and then true uncertainty. So, I mean, a lot of times we're dealing with variability, meaning it's not consistent, but it it follows some distribution that we understand, you know. Um, so, uh, and I think a lot of systems um, deal with variability quite well, because um, otherwise they won't exist, because there's always variability. They simply won't survive. And this is why you have something like stock, for example, or work in progress stock. That is to account for variability. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, which he knows. And um, so it's an interesting one. So is the other systems robust? Uh, probably, I wouldn't say they're really robust. I think they just perform like they should uh, when things are variable. Okay. Um, you know, I think the uncertainty uh, maybe that Tale prefers to is uh, more like tail. Um, long tail events, like like really once every year, or once every ten years, kind of events. Like a big ship um, getting stuck in the Suez Canal, or, or COVID exactly. happening that nobody saw coming. Yeah, that that would be that that would be um, a high, you know, like extreme value events or extreme value theory almost. And then then it becomes interesting. So you know what is robust in that setting, and what is anti um, anti fragile in that setting. Um, so a simple way to look at it is robust, like you said, with, with this event that happened with COVID and with uh, the Swiss Canal, is robust is a supply chain that just carried on, like it, like whatever, just carry on as usual. So those would be robust supply chains. Um, the anti-fragile supply chains, which those will be the ones that made a crap load of money when that happened. True. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That do we know who they are? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we do. So these are ones that somehow, by hook or by crook or whatever, they they tend to make money when uh, when 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 bad things happen to everybody else. Um, and how how do you set up a system like that? Is that is an interesting um, that is an interesting challenge. So robust, I can kind of understand. How do you make your system robust? Um, and you're right, they it tends to be in contradiction with optimized. So with an optimized system, you want to have to be as lean as possible and low cost and as efficient as possible, uh, which means like if, if something changes significantly, usually those solutions break very quickly. Yeah, so um, anti uh, robust in that setting might be, you know what, we, we will insource maybe 70% of our supply chain and outsource 40% of our supply chain. No, I don't think that adds up to 100%, but anyway, 60% will insource, 40% will outsource. Um, that means if, if stuff happens, you have 40% to play around with. You know, if, if your demand falls, you can drop off your, um, your contractors. If demand picks up, you can bring in new, um, new contractors. Because the mechanisms are already in place to deal with, with shorter term contractors. Okay. Yeah, correct, correct. So, um, and then the anti-fragile ones, that is a tricky one. Usually that, for that to happen, you have to have highly reactive systems um, that can, that, 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 doesn't, um, that doesn't just react to these kind of strange events, but can exploit it. Um, so in, in waste, um, I, I don't think it's that common in waste because it's a essential service and it's, and it's a pretty simple essential service. 
you know, you go out, you collect, um, you pick up, you take it back to a um, facility. So even during COVID, I don't think many, I don't think of any organizations that benefited um, from it, but the service went on, didn't, it, it didn't go down to an halt. So um, I think the, the waste collection systems are pretty robust. And, and if you look at a waste collection system, you will see that pattern of, um, you know, we own some of the vehicles, but we also know how to subcontract to, and we also have different operators. So to, yeah, to give an example, in, in, in Singapore at least, they, they, they subcontract waste collection. So it goes to private companies, but one of the companies is government owned. Ah, okay. And the other ones are private. And, uh, and are the government the, owned one uh, subsidized? Um, no, they still have to stand on their own two feet, um, in a sense. They, but what also happens is if any of the other companies um, collapses, then the government one will take over um, the collection of that other company. So um, I, I think they have some buffer to have extra capacity, extra vehicles. Uh, to make sure that if one of the other companies fail for some other reason, like the asset gets frozen because they own owned by a Russian oligarch, I don't know, then um, then the um, the, the Singapore um, company, um, sponsored company, if you want to call it that, um, will make sure that that um, operations um, can continue. Okay, but but I yeah. guess they they have a little bit more fat in terms of they don't have to be that lean uh, in terms of being that competitive at the end of the day. Correct, yeah. Th that they will yeah. actually go and undercut the the other operators. Yeah, exactly. And I think I think the government um, probably over the board they they also um, don't allow one contractor to have all the contracts. So there's always a spread of contractors. So you have the efficiency of a competitive supply chain uh, because there is some competition, but you have this this one unit with fat that. That makes sure that the system won't collapse if if two of your um, you know private companies suddenly have to seize operations. So so I think that that's, that for me would be a robust system, but but not but not an anti-fragile system. Yeah, yeah. Do do you think well if we, if we talk about supply chains more generally, that smaller organizations are typically a lot more responsive, a lot more um, agile in that sense to to be able to respond to these changes. Yeah, absolutely, and um, and and it usually happens when you have these like major shock events. Then usually some of the big players fall over, and some of the smaller players rise to the top because they they were just able to exploit it. Um, and I mean this this happens in the startup world whenever there's chaos for some or other reason, whether it's COVID or the Swiss Canal. Um, it's always good for startups because it means it it shakes everything up. Uh, which means, and startups are by definition quick. It's the only thing they can be as quick because they've got nothing else going for them. Um, so they um, they they in a good position to exploit new new opportunities uh, that come along. Yeah. So I think you're right. So it's interesting. I I almost I almost think that I don't think the solution can be anti fragile. I think the system can be anti fragile. Uh, because the the solution has to change uh, to exploit the, the the new the new environment. So um, so yeah, it's 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 a fascinating concept. I I think in my mind, maybe it's because of my engineering background, it's easier for me to identify robust um, robust systems and to understand the mechanics versus truly um, anti fragile systems. So. Okay. And and do you think we generally? Um, if I kind of have to generalize that we that we are that in the field of optimization that we are dealing with variability well enough, do you think that there's a lot still a lot of fragile ways of of going about modeling? Um, it depends on it depends on who you're talking to. If you're, if you're talking about academia and research, then absolutely yes. Yes, yes in 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 which don't deal with variability at all <laughs> or, or very or very poorly um, if it comes to models that are in practice um, by you know by the fact that they've survived and they've implemented means they have to account for variability and I think this goes back to your previous point where often in practice you see a lot of very simple models like theory of constraints or more heuristic type of, of approach. Type. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's and it's often because they're better able to just account for variability um, compared to to like hyper optimized um, systems that are kind of designed under assumptions of no variability. Yeah, absolutely. And what what's interesting is I don't know um, I don't know if there's been research if there's been any good research to kind of just just maybe do a deep dive into the credibility of these crude heuristic methods um, and their performance um, because I'm sure there's there's there has to be some good sound mathematical principles behind their performance and survival. Uh, maybe it's because they they shouldn't be that they actually work fairly well. Um, in, at least in, in highly variable and even uncertain environments, is you know, we, we can recover if we apply these. Yeah, um, it, it could be. So um, so in that sense, yeah, I think a lot of the models that we deal with, especially the more complex ones or the hyper-optimized ones, they tend to um, ignore variability and, and, and even uncertainty in certain, to some extent. Oh, like well, I think sure. if we really talk yeah. about the, the tailed events, the black <laughs> swan events, then... Um, they are black swans by definition. Yeah, 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 exactly. But I mean, so for example, if if you have a heuristic that you can tweak a bit and you can tweak it quickly, let's compare it to an optimization model. So you have a optimization model can probably cater well for variability. Um, so let's say you built an optimization model um, and a tail event happens. Um, now you don't have enough time to rebuild your, um, sorry, your simulation model. Like you have to start making different decisions tomorrow, but now your simulation model is no longer valid. So now you can build a new one, but it's going to take you another year to build your new. Sim so in, in that in that sense, these simple heuristics are easy to tweak. So they allow you to react quicker um, to these um, to this new environment that you suddenly exposed to. So um, I think that would be one of the benefits of these like crude. Um, crude, simpler heuristics and methods is that just easy to tweak, easy to apply, quicker decision making versus complex models that, that take a long time time to build um, and, and too long to build um, in some practical settings. So. Yeah, great stuff. So in talking about quick, fast, uh, short term decisions, what's next for Waste Labs? In the case, watch the space. <laughs> well, I mean, we're still still going on. It's a it's a tough environment for startups at the moment. Um, 2021 was fun. Now um, now it's kind of tough. Um, but I mean, as as long as we have clients and we we're adding value to clients, um, yeah, we, we will continue to to add value and and have fun. So it, it's still a fun journey to go from you know studying something researching it, becoming a master in it to ultimately actually, okay, now they exproductize it and put it out um, in the real world. Um, so it's it's been an interesting journey, um, which which I'm thankful I had, like through all the exposure and the different places I went to. So it's um it's it's been it's been a fun journey. So um and look I'm a startup so I I, I, I can barely tell you what's gonna happen next month. <laughs> so so if, it's, if you ask me where I'm gonna sit next year, um uh, uh, you know, it's, it's going to change month to month. So uh, startups use, use a lot of heuristics in our day-to-day -day decision making. <laughs> <laughs> so you really practice what you preach. <laughs> Elias, it was really great talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it and sharing your insights. Looking forward to to see where where your journey takes you next. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity. And yeah, it was, it was a good conversation. Um, and thanks for having me.